Strain Yamatej, uh, Associate Director at the Eurasia Group. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. You are a veteran of the uh, Adele uh, program, right? That's right. That's right. I joined. I had a privilege to be a part of Adele last year. And uh, I came back uh, to, to join this year's cohort in an interactive workshop that we did uh, earlier this morning. How did it go? It, it went excellent. Uh, we tried to give a context to my colleague Mariana from Brazil. Me, I'm originally from Serbia, but based in New York. So we tried to integrate her work from academia and think tank world, mine from diplomacy, public policy, and private sector in contextualizing for this year's cohort these geopolitical crises that we have ensuing around the world and what that specifically means for the Atlantic Basin. Can we reimagine the Atlantic Basin as a mega region specifically focused on the southern part that is not integrated vis-a-vis -vis the north and using the expertise from our cohorts uh, members from civil society, development, energy, uh, sustainability, and of course international relations to, to answer those questions. So um, precisely, um, I know that the Eurasia Group at the beginning of each, each year and at the end of each year actually uh, forecasts what the major risks right. for next year are, go are going to be. 2024 is going to be full of elections. Yes. Um, India is one of them. Uh, Taiwan, of course, yes. is uh, going to be a, a global spotlight. Uh, and many more, but two that are of interest to the Atlantic region are first the ones in the European Union yes. and second the one uh, in the United States, just to call the Northern Atlantic. Yes. What are your expectations in these two fronts? Absolutely. I think, as you point out, that those two are the most consequential for the Atlantic Basin and for the entire world. And counterintuitively, perhaps, but the first one has, we expect, zero to little effect and the second one has major effect. So the EU won in June, we expect a solid uh, victory of the current ruling coalition. In fact, the increase of the parliamentary seats in the EU Parliament of EPP and consequently formation of the commission that is similar uh, to the current one. So more or less the status quo. And in fact, despite some right wing populism rising across the continent, by and large, I would argue those concerns are not yet met and won't be in 2024. We saw yesterday was uh, the, the new, the first day of the government of Poland, uh, which is extremely pro-EU, led by Donald Tusk uh, with Foreign Minister Radek Sikorski, so all EU enthusiasts. Um, and, and more broadly, we saw once uh, Prime Minister Maloney stepped in that uh, her rhetoric went to policy implications that were more aligned with Brussels than anti-Brussels. So I would not be raising any, any red flags of any Italy exits, poll exits or any other quote-unquote exits in, in that regard. Will it be tricky given the, what's happening in the Middle East and potential migrant influx for sure? Uh, German government is uh, a bit weaker as well given the tripartite coalition, given somewhat weaker chancellor. But by and large at the institutional level at Brussels we expect zero, uh, zero so small changes next year. On the, on, the, on, on the other side of the pond is anything but peaceful. Uh, the United States will enter a very dramatic period of pre-election campaigning on both sides, uh, meaning Democratic Party and the GOP, the Republican Party. With the extremely strong conviction, we expect President Biden and former President Trump to face each other one more time uh, for the potentially final time, right? Um, and with the, it's too early to call shots, but some of the major signposts, as we call them, so what could determine the elections, uh, will be the status of economy, but more importantly, the perception of the status of economy. Currently, economy is doing much better, but the perception even among Democratic voters is not yet picking that up. Mm -hmm. Age on both sides, the cognitive ability, quite frankly, and unfortunately, we have to speak about that in the, the strongest military power in the world, but is one of the major risks, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps more for President Biden, but also on for current president, uh, former President Trump. Uh, Unlike that, legal proceedings, for example, for us will play zero effect in a sense that it will only reinforce the status quo. If President Trump is uh, convicted of any, uh, in any of the criminal cases, it will only reinforce potentially me as an opponent of President Trump, so I will continue voting against him, or you as for his fan to keep voting for him, reinforcing the narrative that one or the other sides are, are taking. Uh, so that's the most consequential election 
potential Biden 2 administration would continue with a strong relationship with the EU and with NATO. Potential Trump 2 administration is very hard to predict, but it would definitely be more antagonistic, let's say, to uh, many multilateral uh, arenas and turn more on a bilateral relationship that they uh, turn to in their first administration, even more aggressively now. It's a quote unquote payback time that they would that they would call for the last four years of what they saw as a legitimate election. Just a, a last question. If you were to compile uh, these different probabilities that mm -hmm. you identified both for the European side and the uh, North American side of the Atlantic, um, what would you think the overall direction would be for uh, the relation between these two blocks to further explain? Some have identified that actually overall, in terms of trade policy, uh, in terms of uh, the, the, you know, the subsidies or, I mean, the, the fiscal stimulus that was given to the Biden administration after the one that was approved during the Trump administration, some of the bilateral, uh, I mean, the, the, the bipartisan agreements that were reached in Congress, there were lots of continuities, actually, between the Biden administration Absolutely. and the Trump administration, and that actually even the idea of trying to uh, mobilize European nations in defense spending in particular is something where the trajectory was yes uh, same yes uh, that's that's a very good point that I also stress usually because except for handshaking Twitter um, you know press conferences some minor symbolic politics aside as you rightly pointed out foreign policy by and large was very similar I would call it 85% similar uh, uh, including in the Middle East through uh, Kushner's uh, Abraham Accord, Kushner led the Abraham Accords mm -hmm. through uh, NATO spending that other country that other presidents wanted to push for earlier. And again, delivery, we can say, argue it's not the most diplomatic way to do it. And perhaps President uh, Trump at that moment didn't know what is the ruling party in a given country. Mm -hmm. Is it a prime minister or president who is the head of state? But all those semantics aside, the actual implementation, the core policy stayed the same. Um, this might be different today because of over the course of four years of Biden administration, some thanks to Biden administration, some because of the broader geopolitical issues around the world, uh, things have changed, uh, primarily in Russia, Ukraine. So uh, what we called back in last June, peak NATO. NATO was at its peak support, the Western more broadly support toward Ukraine. That's not going to rise anymore. It's only going to fall, not dramatically, but it will keep falling for sure. Uh, the Middle East uh, erupted. Uh, and the, uh, a certain thaw or uh, putting a floor under the deteriorating relationship between uh, Beijing and Washington has ensued over the past three to four months, um, culminated at the APEC summit. So Biden administration attempted to re-engage with uh, Xi Jinping and Chinese Communist Party and China more broadly. That's not going to be the case um, with President Trump. So that's one major uh, policy, uh, foreign policy, top one, I would call it, before Russia, Ukraine or the Middle East as the two conflicts that you will see fading in the news articles, unfortunately, as we move toward the elections. But uh, but U.S.-China is not going anywhere. That will only increase. And that's the most fundamental split, most consequential for other countries as well, except if you are Russia, Ukraine, Israel or Palestine, obviously. But even there, I argue that uh, potential for quote unquote, some kind of peace, frozen conflict, even partition of the country uh, would be far quicker on the table should uh, the new president in the White House be the old one, meaning President Trump. Strainia, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Thanks.